አደባባይ ሚዲያ ለወገንተኝነት ጀርባውን የሰጠ ግዚያዊ ጥቅምን አምብኝ ብሎ የዘመመን ሊያቀና ኡነትን አውቀትን አስከትሉ ኢኮኖሚያዊና መንፈሳዊ መረጃዎችን እንካችሁ ይላል ተኩዚናዎች ዘጋቢ ፊልሞች ጥልቅ ትንታኔዎች በአደባባይ ሚዲያ ይቀርባሉ ራያች ግዚያዊ ማከለና ዘመናዊ አጭ በእውነት የነጠሩ መረጃዎች በእውቀት ደግፎ ለሀገራችን ብሎ ለዓለም ህዝብ ማዳረስ ነው አደሳችን አደባባይ ኢንፎ ሚዲያ አት ጂሜል ዶት ኮም ዌብሳይታችን www. አደባባይ ዶት ኮም ያግኙን ይርዱን ዮላችን ስለሆነች ኢትዮጵያ በአደባባይ እንዝክባለን አደባባይ ሚዲያ Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us from around the world. This is Adawa Media's Your Digest program and my name is Hiwa Tadesa and I'll be your host for the day. Today I'll be in conversation with Zamarit Exarha Yilma. She will be telling us about growing up in the church, um the mesmer services that she does and campus life and many various um interests and passions that she does have. Stay with us. I would like to invite Exara Yilma today to uh, join me in this conversation. As many of us know, Exara, we know her from her um, Mesmer services. Thank you, Exara, for being here with us. And Nkwana uh, Darasesh. Nkwana Darasesh. And thank you so much for inviting me on your media. It means a lot. Oh. Of course. And we also have um a ASL translator today. Um Israel Dam Dal she'll be joining us as well. So she she'll be translating throughout the event for us. Just to um introduce Exara a bit. I know most of us know her from her her Mesmer um, services. She released uh, what is now the very first Ethiopian Orthodox Mesmer. English Mesmer um Tawahudo as a teenager in 2016 and her second album just came out this year um about a month ago at Tawahudo second as well um there is someone who believes in social servitude and community development as such she has been involved in philanthropic work from a very young age and advocated for um communities and she continues to advocate as well for many social and political causes so that will be on the topic of our conversation today as well and to start off this come on um, this conversation today Zara could you tell us uh what your upbringing was like um and how that shaped who you are today sure so um i again want to thank you here at and um adababa media for this great opportunity and for wanting to know more about um my service i guess um so to talk about my upbringing as many people know um i come from amazing parents i'm very lucky and fortunate to have them um most of them know as servers within the church yelma hayu within um his service with gospel um within the gospel music or hymnology and then um my mother as well within sunday school and a lot of other things but um my family because of their work and because of their passion um were very spiritual and are very spiritual and in, instill that um lesson upon their children and that's kind of the household we grew up in so when we were little you know um we were in sunday school in little car seats and um we would be a part of the mahalit would be part of all of these amazing services within the church and um that was something that was very prevalent within our lives but as well as spirituality our parents really wanted us to make sure we have an understanding of the world and be that blade that's um sharp on both ends or be able to work towards that in the future so um my father was very very keen on us always talking about um like 
world politics and cultural politics and all of these other things that shape our identity and shape us within Ethiopia and then shape us within America as well. So it was very interesting at our house. Um, we'd always get into debates. We'd always be like, no, this, but this. And, you know, and um, one of the things my dad always said was, um, you have to read, you know, like reading was a big part of our lives. And my mom also, we would have library trips where we'd bring down, we'd bring seriously a hundred books, you know? And um, we'd always have different types of books, like books about science, books about religion, just books about everything, you know? Cause um, our motto in the house was there's no such thing as bad knowledge, right? So it's good to fill your mind with all of these different things and then you can sort them out with your family and you can sort out what is good, what is bad, you know? Um, things like that later on. So um, we were very pushed to form our knowledge and to go after um, our knowledge ourselves, which I think is amazing because it just gives so much freedom in the house, right? And then after we do all of this reading and, you know, we watch all of these things, we can come back and have those conversations. So in our house, it's always open conversation. There's no question that's inappropriate to ask because they always say, you know, if you don't ask us, who are you going to go later on and ask? And what kind of answer will that person give you later on when you go? So it was very, any question that come, would come to our mind, we would come in the house and we would ask it, you know? And when it comes to spirituality, um, it's very, okay, well, here are the answers. And later on, you know, I want you to have actual contextual um actual contextual things to back up your answers right so it can't be oh you know i know mary um i know there's intercession through mary and that you can't believe in intercession through mary there has to be something you need to back that up with because the world will challenge you and you know all of these lessons we learn as as kids i mean it, it's true when we get older right yeah there's times when um you know like it's annoying and it's annoying to listen to our parents and things like that but um, it always ends up being true. So I'm very grateful that we had that type of holistic upbringing that, you know, let us be curious and explore and, um, you know, really pushed us to be our own individual selves. And it, it, there wasn't ever like, a, OK, well, you have to be an engineer. You have to be a lawyer. You know, obviously they have a preference on what they want us to be. But um, it's it's what can you do and then what can you do? Um, how can you serve your community with the thing that you do? So it doesn't matter if you are in skills or it doesn't matter if, you know, um, you're in theater or you do all of these other um, or you take all these other career paths at the end of the day. You know, our goal in this house is to be able to impact the community as a whole, because, you know, we have to think outside of that individual perspective because we are a community. And, you know, when our church teaches us to not think for ourselves, but to think for our brothers and to think about our community as a whole. So I really appreciate and I admire how our parents really instilled that in the little things that um, we do within the house. Yeah, it's really awesome. You've gotten to that age now where you fully appreciate what your parents have been able to do for you and continue to do as well. So that's pretty awesome. Um, and like you mentioned, your father is very well known and he's very beloved in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. And I was just wondering, what does a legacy mean to you? Oh, good question. Um, it's a huge legacy, right? So uh, you know, when I go to Ethiopia, I, I never claim, I'm not like, oh, Yilma is my father, because I I think he's all of our fathers. And it's also interesting to hear about what people say about him, you know, without being afraid that a family member is there or something else. And so many of the things that I hear is just like how out of this world he is. You know, there's so much respect and admiration for the work that he does and for the service that he does. And like what a gift that God has given him. And it just me chills thinking about it, you know, like he was God selected him and he um, continued to give you know, and serve God in that path and really not deter from it a single day in his life. So it is a huge legacy. And a lot of people know him for the gospel mesmus or the um, hymnology that he puts forward. But there's a lot of other things that um, Yilma Hailu does. You know, he's a writer. He has books. He has poetry. He writes um, like theaters uh, and he has scripts that he's written and one of the most amazing things I admire about him is he's an amazing artist and mm -hmm. um, that's a thing that he just absolutely enjoys and when he's not writing Mesmur you know he can paint and not um, yeah he'll paint for hours and he won't get tired and it's just so energizing to him you know and it's very inspirational the things he paints 
you know, that's the aspect of spirituality. It's in his life in every category of his life. So if it's not when he's writing Mazmur, when he's painting, there's some sort of spiritual connection that connects it back to Innat Bitekistan and that connects it back to God. And it, that is just such another, it's, it's showing his blessing more and more, you know? So I think his legacy, um, a lot of people have this idea like, oh, you know, a, a parent's legacy, a child has to fulfill that. I think that for him, I don't think that's the case. I think his legacy is for the community. And I think as a community, we need to carry on that legacy. And it's something that benefits all of us together instead of just, you know, his immediate family. Yeah. Wow, that's that's such beautifully said that his legacy is truly for our church and truly for all of us as a community because he's a giant. Um, and I, I know most of us grew up listening to him. Uh, for me, my first exposure of his uh, painting is he was uh, doing a presentation at one of uh, UITY's conferences. And I was just blown away. I just I only thought of him as a as a mezzamaran, you know, as a gospel singer and being able to see those that different aspects of him. And I've been able to read a couple of things that he's written it really is um something that we should continue we could continue as a community not just the immediate family and i love that um so in that case then what does what does staying why is it important for you to stay in the church what does that mean to you um kind of touching on the values that have been instilled in me and then later on my own findings mm -hmm. and um my own understandings of my spirituality the church to me is not just uh, a place that, you know, we go to when we're sad or a place we go to on Sundays or for holidays. It's really my livelihood. And to me, it's a symbol of my salvation. And it is really where I find my salvation. Um, and it, it, besides just my salvation, too, you know, it's become my culture. A lot of times people think that your culture is, you know, like it has to be tribal or it has to be something that's ethnic, you know. But your culture can and should be your religion first and foremost, if that is what you're putting forward, right? So um, to me, it's, you know, it's how I get through the day. It's how I know that there's a better life than this. You know, it's this life, especially with everything going on within our global condition right now, it's really hard, you know, to continue and to be motivated to do the things that we do. Again, when we know that there's a better life, that everything we do today, you know, it's to get into that eternal life. That is more motivation to me than anything will be right that is um that is such an amazing look forward to and to think about so it is all of those things for me and it's how i form myself and it's how i want to lead my life a church is not church is not necessarily um like a church life for you church is part of your life church is just life right it's not something that you do in contemporary lives between your college life and your family life and then your church life or your friend's life kind of thing right yeah i love that before we continue uh do you mind singing one mesmer for us sure thank you all right so I will sing a song from the new album because it's beautiful songs on there. Um, I will sing, this one's a translation. So it's um, It's a song that Zamari Yenua had written. Um, if you would like to say a few words before I begin. No, go for it. Okay, awesome. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. The angel on whom was the sign of the cross Did the Father send from heaven above The Son of my nature will descend to you From heaven he dove to deliver the news the angel on whom was the sign of the cross Did the Father send from heaven above The Son of my nature will descend to you From heaven he dove to deliver the news the perfect Son of God will be one with your flesh 
It will come on to you, the Holy Spirit, unity with your flesh, harmony with your soul. He will be one with both, the Most High Son of God, virgin you shall bring forth. The angel on whom was the sign of the cross, did the Father send from heaven above. The Son of my nature will descend to you. From heaven he dove to deliver the news. Who is eyes for the blind and ears for the deaf? He who heals the distraught and speaks for the mute, for the dead to walk, for the seed of your womb. His words can do it all. He has sent me to you. The angel on whom was the sign of the cross did the Father send from heaven above the son of my nature will descend to you from heaven he dove to deliver the news may your greeting be grand may it warm her heart for she shall rejoice when she hears the grand part like you made him mute, Zacharias the priest, tell her thou shalt bring forth joy and not sadness. The angel on whom was the sign of the cross, did the Father send from heaven above the Son of my nature will descend to you from heaven he dove to deliver the news gabriel swelled with news to deliver to her he came down from above ordered by the savior through lebanon rippled the news of his coming Beating his wings, he came, transcendent glittering. The angel on whom was the sign of the cross, did the Father send from heaven above. The Son of my nature will descend to you. From heaven he dove to deliver the news. The angel on whom was the sign of the cross did the Father send from heaven above. The Son of my nature will descend to you. From heaven he dove to deliver the news. Glory be to God. Amen. And may you hear the hymns of the angels. That was beautiful. Um, thank you for sharing that with us. And I also like to, to thank um, Israel for joining us and for translating this conversation for us as well. Uh, we much appreciate it. Um, and if we could continue this conversation in Dara, since we're getting to know you, um, may I take you to high school? And I was wondering, um, how would you, if you could sum up uh, your high school experience in two words, how would you describe it? Amazing question. Okay. Um, I would use the words awakening and challenging. Those are the two words I would use for my high school experience. Wow. Tell me more about that. Um, I choose the word awakening because I think it's in high school that I um, really started to understand the things that I was passionate about. So um, in my spiritual world, I started um, really loving translating Mesmur and I really fell in love. Um, I've always loved Wedeb and Kenny and all those things, but um, I really started, you know, um, 
really going after those things. And I had an amazing Sunday school as well that really mm -hmm. pushed, you know, um, us to be more engrossed in the hymns and all of these amazing traditions of the church. Um, awakening also for my secular world, I think I understood my identity and I understood that the parts of my identity was not something I should be ashamed about. And it wasn't something I needed to, um, you know, worry that I wouldn't be offending other people or worry that, you know, someone wouldn't like it if I brought this thing up, you know? So um, I choose that word. And I also choose challenging because it was challenging to, you know, become into yourself. And I think a lot of youth have that trouble, especially in starting high school and even as early as middle school and elementary, right? We have these this strong identity that is present at home, that's present in our worship spaces. And then when we try to take that identity into another space, it doesn't really have um, a platform for us to share that identity. And not only have a platform, but people don't allow us to be our true selves. So we end up being these different versions of ourselves. We are different at church. We're different with our family. Our friends know a different version of us. And we're not that same ideal, you know, um, we're not ideally ourselves and we don't have that one definition of who are we. We don't really have that answer to that yet. So it is a huge challenge, I think. Okay, so like how have you been able to merge those different personalities into one, not necessarily personalities, those identities that you have into one to say, you know, I could take up the spaces in, in the spaces that I want to be in without having to negotiate one part out and, you know, kind of trying to fit into the things that are around. Right. Um, I think that's really, that's the question of identity, right? But I think specifically for us that have more of the diverse, um, the diverse levels of our identity and many layers to our identity, you know, I think that's something I'm still growing into. But um, the way to answer your question, I've been kind of trying to merge it is understanding that it's okay to, you know, be, bold about my Christianity, even in spaces I think that that's not welcome, because that is a part of my identity, you know? And it's been a true example for me when I, you know, see other peers that are very, um, they're very proud of their identity, right? And we see our own parents and our family that are very proud, you know, um, to be immersed in their identity and to share that with other, other people. I think that it's not um, putting ourselves onto other people. And it's not, you know, like, um, being too much or and those types of things to be ourselves so it's exhausting you know being an extrovert at home and then when you go to school you're an introvert because the things you like to talk about your friends might not like to talk about you know it's exhausting having to have these multiple versions of ourselves if you don't want to call them personalities but you know they're multiple versions and you know once we understand that we can be that one true identity you know and be in these different spaces and still be ourselves and take ourselves and be okay with ourselves being in these places and educating, you know, that environment and saying, you know, you know, I'm Ethiopian and this is what our culture believes. And, you know, like, this is why I, I'm fasting. This is why I don't eat meat during this areas. Right. Um, I think it's important because it helps those spaces grow to um, include people like us as well. Absolutely. Um, we're having a conversation with Amari Tikziara. I'd like to invite all our viewers to like and share this conversation as well as subscribe if they haven't already. Um, and thank you for joining us. And um, Xara, if I could, if we could switch um, into a different conversation real quick. How have you been, um, how did you get involved uh, in the philanthropic world so young? Right. So I think um, church is a huge first lesson i know my answer for everything shouldn't be church but it is it is church and spirituality right and i think um that idea of you know working to better your community for me it was when i got to middle school and high school i was like okay well how can i do that right and i think a lot of students and a lot of youth they volunteer and um they give their time to a lot of these other benevolent organizations and i think i wanted to do a little more when i was in high school so um i my community was very um, supportive and I just got up and I was like, hey, I wanna just gather school supplies and take them to Ethiopia. And it was a good response from, you know, like the district of my school and the Ethiopian community around me and things like that. And I was very surprised on how supportive everybody was. And I think that's something as youth, maybe we don't understand that, you know, it, it just takes an idea. And if you are motivated behind that idea and you, you know, go to that office and say, hey, 
I'm gonna put a box in this all around school and I want to make an announcement every you know every week and run a drive because it's gonna help my community you know this, this is the environment we're in currently um if not if it's not super supportive it still is supportive in um many aspects especially when it's it's easier when we're in high school you know and when we're in college to do some of these philanthropic things so for me it was um a great success when i was in high school you know and i called it project pencil and i was able to take almost ten thousand dollars worth of school supplies to ethiopia with my father and give it personally to the students there right so if anybody that's watching right now has some sort of thought or has always dreamed of doing something. And it doesn't matter what, if you're in college, high school, middle school, um, you know, elementary school, finding the right guidance and then finding the right support in order for them, for you to do that is very important, but you can definitely do it. There's no age to being good and to doing something, you know, and there's nothing that really holds you back really. Yeah. What are the means that you, you raise this fund? I was reading somewhere that you um, had a dance marathon. Could you tell us the different means sure. in which you so, used to raise um, this fund? There's many ways of fundraising, right? Um, one of the ways that we fundraised in our committee when I was in high school was we did this thing called a dance marathon. So um, you can do this with really anything. Um, you can do a knitting marathon, a walking marathon, but it's where someone... Um, says to a, another person, hey, you know, if I go to this place and I do this activity for the whole day, will you give me $50? And a lot of people, you know, especially for youth, they want to be supportive. So they'll be like, yeah, write my name down. I'll do it. Mm -hmm. So you go and you get a lot of these lists of people and you're like, they're going to, you know, I have 10 people. They're all going to give me $50, $500. And I'm going to um, donate this to this cause, you know? So let's say it's, um, you know, like a knitting marathon and everybody sits there and knits, you know, the whole time or does anything, you know, paints the whole time for like 10 hours. So it's a marathon. It's a long time. Yeah. But that means that, you know, if you get 10 people there and all 10 people get 50, uh, another 10 people to donate $50 to them, that's a lot of money that you'll raise for that thing. So it's so fun. You can, as youth, you can be creative with these things, you know. We don't have to stick to like the general ideas of fundraising and things like that to better our community. You know, we can be creative and challenge our community, you know, when they say, no, I don't think that'll work. Be like, nope. You know, let's try it. You know, let's yeah. push those boundaries. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I love those ideas. So you are also involved with student government and Model United Nation. Could you tell me a, a little bit about those as well? Sure. So um, when I was in high school, I was also really passionate about government. So mm -hmm. there's um, great. The I know the YMCA has an international. Um, all around the U.S. Um, model United Nations and model state government um, program. So whatever state you're in, if there's a YMCA, you can go to that YMCA and be a part of this program. And then um, you can, uh, you know, like actually be a part of government. And there's actual lobbyists and legislative um, people within legislator that leg legislative. I'm sorry, I can't speak. That come <laughs> and um, are part of these programs. And you know, it's a great opportunity if you want to um, shadow. If you want to, um, you know, intern or something like that, still while you're in high school, these mm -hmm. platforms are amazing. So for me, it really helped me being a part of these um, state government, model United Nations and things like that, because it adds to your knowledge, but it also opens a lot of doors for you. Yeah, that kind of gives you an experience um, as far as looking at how the world is run, right? Um, so in that case, then, have you been involved in any, in any kind of like real politics um, conversations or activism within the United States or abroad in Ethiopia, Avini? Um, politics. So right out of high school, um, when I entered college, I really wanted I was in I really wanted to be involved in politics and wanted to grow within that. Mm -hmm. And um, my I entered for a senator here and um, I entered for her election campaign. And um, I found out that I didn't really like it because it, it takes a lot to make change within politics. So um, I stuck, I'm stuck. i sticking to other routes of trying to make actual tangible change and, you know, like actually involving your community. But when it comes to politics, sometimes it takes longer to make that change, even if it, it, it can happen, but it just takes longer. So yeah. I just so didn't find that to be interesting. In that case, it's, you like more of the social aspect of the work that you do as opposed to doing the political side of the work that um, you've been able to experience. Right. Okay. So um, if you could uh, do one more mesmer for us and then we could talk about your album and um, yeah. 
Sure. One second. All right, this next song is another one from the album. It's called Tabor and Herman. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Tabor and Herman rejoiced in your name for the right hand of God. Jesus appeared, three disciples, a secret he showed. Elias and Moses to them were known. Tabor and Herman rejoiced in your name for the right hand of God. Jesus appeared, three disciples, a secret he showed. Elias and Moses to them were known, Elias and Moses, to them were known. The Lord Jesus Christ was revealed through the Godhead. Oh, how great you are, Mount Tabor, Elias from the land of the immortals, Moses from the land of the dead, Tabor and Herman rejoiced in your name, for the right hand of God, Jesus appeared, three disciples, a secret he showed, Elias and Moses, to them were known. Elias and Moses, to them were known. The God of the immortal, the Savior of the dead. He has defeated dark through the Godhead. You are the Lord of the immortals, Peter said to him. In turn, he showed him glory up the mountain. Tabor and Herman rejoiced in your name. For the right hand of God, Jesus appeared. Three disciples, a secret he showed. Elias and Moses, to them were known. Elias and Moses, to them were known. Who do they call me? He said, posing this question. The answer of many was wrong without intention when the son of man revealed and showed himself they saw the son of god divine and absolute tabor and herman rejoice in your name for the right hand of god jesus appeared Three disciples, a secret he showed. Elias and Moses, to them were known. Elias and Moses, to them were known. Through the clouds of voice said, This is my beloved son. The disciples heard it fell onto their front when they looked up to look at the lord's face they found the face of god beaming with his grace tabor and herman rejoiced in your name for the right hand of god jesus appeared 
three disciples a secret he showed alias and moses to them were known alias and moses to them were known glory be to god amen um, so I actually was wondering, how did you uh, become a gospel singer? What was that journey like for you? Okay. Um, I started translating um, around 14 or 15 years old. Oh, that's very um, young. I what did, sorry, did you say something? No, I was saying that's very young. Quite yes, nice, that is very young. Um, but definitely my first song that i translated was jacob and beersheba and um it i remember um we were singing that mahark version with my dad and we were just mm -hmm. like oh let's just try it let's see if we can try translating jacob to english you know and at that time there were other songs that the church was trying our church um we used to be our church here in minnesota they were trying to translate songs for the kids to sing along and i remember um there was one song that was translated and I wasn't very happy at that age about how it was translated. The English just didn't make sense to me and it upset me that it was translated like that. Mm -hmm. But it was a parent that was trying their best to translate the song, you know? Mm -hmm. And it happened to be one of my dad's songs. I was like, huh. And I was like, dad, can we just sit and like try to translate it? And um, when we tried to translate it, it, it worked very, very well. So um, I kept translating. I translated next, I remember, Nana Imiskana Gita and other, parts of these songs and not um it was it was very very fun for me and it really was just uh like that awakening experience again it, i just was like i don't want to do anything else in my life because there's so many things that need to be translated that our church has you know mm -hmm. and i was like I'm, I'm i think i'm gonna dedicate a part of my life to this but i definitely have to credit you know the hymnology of course um when i think zamari i think i think even Sunday school, there are Zemmari's BS, you know? So yeah. I think, um, you know, my involvement in Sunday school at a very young age and being able to, you know, hold it and on with my shaking hand and, you know, um, be a part of Mahalit and be a part of those services, it definitely, um, and I think it also makes an influence in other people's lives. And when they want to go on to this path of saying, you know, I want to try translating or try, you know, singing an individual song and things like that. It's those foundations that really help us with that. Yeah, that's amazing. So could you tell me what the process of translating looked like to you? The process of translating? Um, so a lot of people think that, you know, it, to translate a song, so you have the lyrics in front of you. So it's if it's Xavier, you must can, you know, it's Xavier God, you must can, thanks be to, you know, or yeah. thanks to, or yeah. glory to him, you know? So, um, but it's not that simple because especially, you know, our Amharic songs, uh, they're the words, you know, there might be one word in Amharic that in order to define this word in English, it's a whole paragraph, you know, because mm -hmm. it, it might not even exist in that magnitude in English. So I think we, um, when I translate, I definitely have to um, first understand why is that song written, right? Mm -hmm. For what time is that song written? Um, who wrote the song? If I can contact that person that wrote the song. So when I translate other ones outside of Zamari um, Ilmas, I make sure to, you know, contact them and be like, oh, why did you write this? What text did you use? I don't know. Where did you get where did you get these words that you sang? This idea, where did it come from? What book? Because if we don't have a book next to us, if we don't have an understanding of um if we don't have an uh, understanding of where the Zema came from, then it's very hard to translate. It's not as easy as, you know, people would think it is. And if it is super simple, that means that something is not being done right about it. So um for the short ones, you know, that is like um Mariam Fidele and things like that, that probably won't take as long to translate and not maybe a lot of people need to overlook that. But definitely for these longer songs, you know, it's one, for me, I have to give it value because it's God's gospel that I'm translating. It's, you know, it's a precious thing that is being translated. But two, there needs to be other guidance when I'm doing it, at least for me. It's multiple people always looking at the words that I'm translating. Is this word correct? You know, is this is this appropriate to use in this space? 
Um, should I use this and this? Uh, all of these, this Zema, is it appropriate for this time? All of these questions have to be asked even when translating, forget even writing, right? Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, that's, I hope I've answered your question. Oh yeah, that's amazing. That's, um, that's a long process and you might need to give a class on that because I think um, we have a lot of amazing mesmers that we can translate and we just don't have the equipment and the way um, to go about doing this. So it's, it's a really good example of how we should go about doing this. Um, so I'm wondering, did you go to a Zema school or is that um, most of your lessons come from Sandy school um, mesmers? Right. Most of my lessons do come from Sunday school or home. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like it's obviously beta uh, lufatno. Again, I also want to be very honest and say that um, it is my mission to, you know, but Zema, but um, fully, like I, I'm like I have to learn it. You know, if if we step out and we say, oh, Zamari Monafelgalo, right? So to me, like that title right there, Zamari Tuxeria, I don't think that I don't that doesn't describe me yet because there's a lot I have to do before I even touch that title, right? Mm -hmm. So um, for me, it's my journey to learn Giz and learn Kene and learn Zema very well and thoroughly that to the level where I'm comfortable with it, right? To the mm -hmm. level I can open a Gizmet off and I can read it and read uh, the Adsats off and like, you know, our the way that our webs and our melodies and our hymns are written, you know, that's all something that if we are choosing this life and choosing to be a part of, you know, the hymnology, we have to understand the way that music is written as well. You know, in the secular world, if you want to, you know, be a musician, the first thing you learn is the foundations of it, right? Mm -hmm. So I think for us, it's not as easy as the music world because it's not something you can learn in one class, right? We have fathers, medigatas, and that have decades under their belt where they're learning this precious teaching of our church. Mm -hmm. But I think it's up to all of us to, um, especially me, it's something that I'm focusing and working on is to, um, you know, be dedicated to structurally learning the teachings of our church that way. Yeah. Um, so now that you have the Zema, you have the translated script, um, it's time for recording. So where do you go to record? What does that studio experience look like to you? So um, studio here, uh, DC, I know, um, is the hub usually for, you know, finding an Ethiopian studio. Um, I did the second one in Ethiopia and that was a lot easier to do it there. Um, but definitely DC is a great place to do it as well. Um, also, there's a lot of technology out there for people that are just, you know, wanting to maybe explore at home. There's a lot of software and things like that. You know, our generation, we can be so tech savvy and we can be very, um, you know, like proactive about it and, you know, produce our own things and just, you know, really be homemade and self-made and strengthen ourselves too. But um, yeah, DC and Ethiopia would be the best places to go. So um, do you use the instruments as you're recording it or is it something um, that we've been able to, I don't know, computerize? So like the Washington and the Kura and the Bagana and Kabaron stuff, like do you walk into the studio with those instruments? Um, so usually um, if you are doing the, vo the vocal, uh, you have other people do it as well. There are some Zamaris that choose to uh, majab themselves. They will play for themselves. But most of the time, um, I know in Ethiopia, this is it's a little different. In DC here, my experience was, you know, um, uh, you're in there with the person playing the instrument. And then while they're playing that, it's recorded separately and then mixed together, right? But in Ethiopia, um, I actually didn't see the people that um, were um, Majame me with the instruments, the other Zamaris, I want to say, because they're also Zamaris, even though it's through an instrument, right? Mm -hmm. um, we did it separately. So I went first for my voice, and then in Nesuba Mi Chachoka, or a day that they could, they went in and um, they recorded on their own. So it's very, you know, modern and very easy to do nowadays. Mm, cool. So how old were you when you first recorded your first album? Um, I was 15 or 16 years old. Oh, wow. So um, when it came out, I remember people were really excited about it. Um, it was the first English album we had for Mesmur. Um, how did you find the reactions uh, from people uh, back then? So the first time I, it came out, I know uh, we mentioned it was uh, maybe four, four years ago, um, mm -hmm. but 
the reaction then, there was a lot of people that were super excited that, you know, wow, our kids are going to have something that we can, you know, ex easily ex have um, accessible that, you know, they can sing along. Wow, when they sing a song, they'll be able to understand it and really meaningfully sing it, right? Mm -hmm. um, on the flip side of that too, there was a lot of people that were confused about why it was important to do that. You know, I got a lot of comments that were saying, you know, Ethiopia bezuk anku allat, lemdin no bengil zenga imaratsu, you know, oromi falla tigdinga le, lemdin no sun imaratsu. Like why did you choose English? Why didn't you choose the other languages of Ethiopia? So I think that um not understanding and confusion comes from not seeing the life that youth live here, not seeing that disconnect because of language that youth have with their church, you know, and with their spirituality and their religion. So um, it, there was a lot of negative feedback back then. A lot of people didn't really appreciate it. And they thought it was a loss of tradition, a loss of culture and faith that we were, you know, preaching and are singing in another language. But between my last CD and now, um, there's between my last CD and now, there's a lot of things that have changed. We've had amazing Mahabas like YOTC and UOTY, and then a lot of Mahabas within different states that have also popped up and um, not Mahabas, but you know, yeah, Mahabas, um, and organizations that have really, um, you know, been doing liturgy in English. They have been preaching in English. They have been doing all of these amazing things within the language that, you know, is the best one to serve our generation with because, you know, that is the language that they happen to understand, right? Um, along with that, we have um, amazing people like, you know, Dag on Dawit recently, um, you know, published a book in English. So we have amazing servers um, like uh, Dag on Gorgorios, Dag on Ephraim, I know from Adawabai, um, amazing individuals that are coming up, you know, and in the leadership of our amazing fathers like Kasi Sefa and all of these um, great and hardworking individuals that understand that, you know, we have to work in order to save our generation and, and we can't afford teaching them Amharic first before teaching them the gospel, right? The first thing they need to understand is the gospel. So um, I think it's a great change between the last album and this one, because this one, there hasn't been any confusion because, you know, over time people have understood the really crisis that has been going on within our generation and Christians within the church. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, like you said, with most of the organizations that we have um, coming up everywhere almost at this point, it's really powerful to see. It's almost like yet inside yet yet service, the service that we have in English, is has seen kind of an awakening to borrow your word from earlier about um, the necessity of preaching the gospel first and foremost before the culture, before the language, right? And saying also that we're not saying we should leave the language behind. We're not saying we should leave the traditions behind. Because like you said, right, you want to learn Akwakwam, you want to learn, um, you want to go to Zema school and all that stuff, like keep the tradition, but do it in a language that's more clear, more easier for everyone um, to participate in. So that's a really powerful idea. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, thank you everyone for following us in this conversation. Um, we're having a conversation with Ixadha Yilma. And um, if you are still here with us, um, please go ahead and share this and like this conversation as well. And we'll be right back after a quick break. አደባባይ ሚዲያ ለወገንተኝነት ጀርባውን የሰጠ ግዚያዊ ጥቅምን አንብኝ ብሎ የዘመመን ያቀና ኡነትን ነው ቀጥና አስከትሉ ኢኮኖሚያዊና መንፈሳዊ መረጃዎችን እንካቹ ይላል ትኩስ ዜናዎች ዘጋቢ ፊልሞች ጥልቅ ትንታኔዎች በአደባባይ ሚዲያ ይቀርባሉ። ራያጭ ግዚያዊ ማከለና ዘመናዊ ዋጭ በእውነት የነጠሩ መረጃዎችን በእውቀት ደግፎ ሀገራችን ብሎ ለዓለም ህዝብ ማደረስ ነው አደሳችን adababai.infomedia@gmail.com ዌብሳይታችን www.adababai.com ያግኙን ይርዱን ዮላችን ስለሆነ ኢትዮጵያ በአደባባይ እንዝክባለን አደባባይ ሚዲያ
Uh, welcome back, everyone, and thank you for being here with us. We're having a conversation with Damari Tegzara Yilma today, and um, so we're going to continue that. We also have Israel um, translating for us as well, and thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate all the work that you're doing for us. Um, so, Tegzara, I know now you're a college student. Um, could you tell us what you're studying and how that's been like for you? Sure. Um, I'm studying um, public health and global studies at, in mm -hmm. college. Um, it's really fun. It was, um, college is a great time because you get to really find what you're passionate about when it comes to career wise, you know, and make those amazing connections, you know, so um, it's been an amazing experience. Hmm, that's awesome. So um, how has how did you get involved with maternal health? Is that part of that your um, education or is that just an interest that you have? Sure. So um, I've always had an interest in maternal health, but um, mm -hmm. I got involved with maternal health um, through my educational experience with working with a couple of organizations and then um, later on um, continuing that experience in Ethiopia and then coming back and continuing and hopefully I'll continue my education um, in a, you know, in a direction related to maternal health as well. Mm. So you mentioned Ethiopia. Did you do any kind of work um, while you were there or on this topic or any other projects? Yeah. So um, when I went to Ethiopia, um, I had the great opportunity of going to um, and working with uh, Zodi to there. It was um, amazing, but it was also great to um, work with to um, hospital. With yes, Zodi to hospital. Okay. Okay. Um, it was really challenging because I went for a seven month period, and I've never been there that long. Um, and since I was a really little kid, you know, and um, I had uh, the most amazing time, you know. And a lot of people are like, oh, you know you're a diaspora, you won't like living there, right? Again, mm -hmm. I also want to kind of say that Ethiopia is really changing, right? And um, there's so many things that are there to be done and there's so many opportunities of, of growth. And there's already so many, you know, um, diasporas that are going back and really, you know, living there and helping their country and, you know, bettering the society as a whole and using their education to strengthen their own community. So I think that's very, very inspiring. Um, I was also able to work with the YMCA there. So I mentioned earlier um, how the YMCA internationally um, has awesome uh, as has awesome government programs and things like that. But, you know, mm -hmm. outside of the usual workout, you know, most people think that the YMCA is just like a gym or like a place they can send their kids to learn how to swim. The YMCA also has a global influence that's really amazing. So the YMCA has three branches in Ethiopia. And um, those three branches, they work and they work to better serve their community. So globally, the YMCA is known for, you know, community based projects and helping and with youth development. So um, I had an amazing opportunity working with them there. And I think it's uh, great for me to share um, a little bit about that. Um, so the YMCA, it started there, you know, um, during the time of Haile Selassie. So it's been there for quite a while. But because of the changes of government, yeah. The places that were there to serve the youth have been taken back by the government. So, um, you know, the places where they serve youth, I know there's a, a space in Arakilo where they serve nearly 200 youth um, that come there and it's in an id debate. So it's in a, um, a house that's owned by the community that like has leaks and it has all of these other things, you know, and it's super tiny, but it serves that much youth a day in that community, you know, and a lot of youth, that's where they find themselves. And within my experience being there they that's where you know like that's their option of after school recreation or that's how they get off of the streets or that's the place that they feel safe in so i think um for all of us that go back to ethiopia to vacation or to take our family back there it's really important we do something there while we're there you know yes it's great to look at churches and go to gedams and you know um go to all these awesome scenic places in ethiopia but it's also important to you know like understand that people that are living there are you know living there in not the most comfortable situations at times and if we have the money and the resources to vacation to go there we can do one thing we can help one person you know we can donate something to help that one facility be better right mm -hmm. so um i think 
we also, because uh, the YMCA is just one example I can give of an organization that's here and there. So, you know, um, with my student government, when the first time we went, or in January when we went, um, our mission there was to work with the YMCA there to, you know, work on workshops and things like that to really help develop the youth and give the knowledge that we've been given here and to really pass on that knowledge. But there's huge opportunities for partnership and huge opportunities for, you know, development, not just us giving it to them, but also the youth there, the population there, there's so much they have to teach, right? So yeah. we shouldn't think of Ethiopia and we shouldn't think of you know, our partnerships as like these giving where we're just helping them get better because they don't have anything and they don't know anything, you know? It's a huge learning experience as well. My biggest thing of any, my experience in Ethiopia is how much I learned, you know? Yeah. More than I gave, I got an abundance when I came here, right? It's really yeah. eye-opening spiritually, it's eye-opening, you know, like secularly, and it's really motivating, you know? and when it's also something that you, a place that you call home, you know, especially, especially for youth that grew up, grow up here, something I've struggled with as well is, you know, this concept of Ethiopia that my parents have talked about, you know, like they listen to Mezmur and they like think about their country and they hear poetry and like they remember this country that they grew up in, right? Mm -hmm. I think us diaspora and us youth that have been born here there's a different type of missing and there's a different type of feeling that we feel or ones that have grown up here for a long time, right? Mm -hmm. it, I don't know how I can biologically miss a place that I've barely gone to, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's it's almost like genetic, like the connection that we have there. And that's how you know it's not just physical, it's spiritual, you know? It's a land that so many spiritual, um, you know, Abuna Teklaiman came from that land and so many amazing things have happened on that land. So of course, you know, that connection is not just going to be with our parents. It's going to be with us too, right? So I think it's time that we like take back what's ours, you know, and use the resources that we have here to really learn, go there and learn, but also, you know, like take part in the communal life there. Yeah. You know, I love how you said it because, you know, I, I moved here when I was about 13, so I grew up in Ethiopia, but there's a sense of missing that I have that's very different from what my parents or my siblings might feel. And it's just like when you walk in Ethiopia, when you get there, I, I swear I feel like my whole like demeanor changes, my whole mood changes. And there's that like sense of ease, sense of relief that you have when you're especially surrounded by people that look like you, that talk like you, that act like you, and realizing like you're not the other anymore, and there's such, such a relief that comes from that. And so working in there, volunteering in there, and even visiting all the places that you mentioned, there's this dimension of wealth that adds into who we are as people, which I really love. So thank you for explaining it that way. Um, but let me take it back to what is maternal health really? Maternal health. Okay, mm -hmm. so maternal health, it's defined as the social, environmental, and, you know, like mental, spiritual, you can add in all of these things, well-being of mm -hmm. a birth giver, a mother, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And when we think of maternal health, you know, automatically we're like, oh, like pregnant woman, you know. Yep. But there's so much more to it. You know, there's women that want to have a family. There's women that have already have a family. There's, you know, people that are in that maternal role that maybe like they didn't biologically have that child, but they're still like, you know, attached and they still are serving as a maternal figure and they are they are a maternal role for that child, right? So um, when, it, when we talk about maternal health, you know, there's certain things that should be foundations of our existence, you know, or certain things that are like basic, like, okay, um, water, you know, food, mm -hmm. things like that. And when you go a step above for me, I, at least I think I maternal health is right there because it starts with, you know, like the start of human life. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, when we give I, when we pay attention to maternal health and we have conversations about maternal health, especially I think it's very needed in our community. You know, we have a community that has a, a strong maternal presence. Right. Mm -hmm. But we don't have space for that maternal presence to voice itself. Right. Oh, wow. So we don't really have conversations we don't have platforms where we sit back and we let mothers teach and we let mothers talk about the things that are going on with their in the, within their communities 
whether it be biological, so whether it be, you know, um, like their labor and birth experiences or, you know, the experiences of health within their children or whether it be that societal value and that societal um, conversation that needs to be had, you know, when mm -hmm. we create a platform for that, I think we can move on and do really amazing things as a society. Mm -hmm. So I think um, that's something that, you know, can, we can have a conversation about another time, but just to put in your minds, it's something that, you know, it should be defined larger than what people really define as maternal health and, you know, like that pregnancy thing, but it's mm -hmm. way bigger than that. Yeah, I love that. And I love the comparison you made with having such a maternal presence in our community, but not necessarily having that space to talk about it. And I, I'll be honest with you, for me, when I think of maternal health before, it was I just thinking about like that pregnancy, the birthing experience, and then, you know, calling it done after that. And thank you for explaining that in detail. And I can't wait to see what you'll be able to do this, um, what you'll be able to do in Ethiopia along this topic, because I know like you've also um, interned, it's it's a huge problem in Ethiopia, especially with Fitzula, because kids get married so young and their body can't handle it. And there's a lot of um, issues that come with that. And this holistic service, a holistic medicine that you're involved in will be such a powerful addition to our community as well. So I can't wait to see what you'll be able to do with that. Um, so after college, right, when you think, oh, I think I'm getting feedback um in after college basically what do you want to walk away from in college after um beside the degree um i think college i, I want to walk away with like a tool belt of skills if that makes sense um you know in college you get to experience a lot of um ex you know like platforms where you can speak so public speaking, um, you get to practice writing, you get to do all of these things that are foundations for your life moving forward. You know, even while you are in college, you know, when you go and try to get jobs, internships, and, you know, really make your experience grow, there's a lot of um, experiences within college and there's a lot of skills that college teaches you, even if it's, you know, um, how to talk to your professor and how to, you know, communicate properly, things like that, that will later on benefit and how you talk with your employer and things like that, you know? And all of the experiences and the connections for me, I made amazing connections with faculty members at my um, university. So I'm excited to not just have those connections for my career, but it's nice to have, um, you know, like intellects that, you know, they're teaching me the things that I'm passionate about. So it's amazing to, you know, add to that network and add to the things that really, you know, drive you towards your lives. Yeah. Um, I think other than that too, um, for me, it was uh, really um, like the social networks as well within college that I'm going to walk away with learning a lot of things from those social networks and learning a lot of things about, you know, communication, how to um, do work as a community, do work as a team, you know, um, how to be a leader, how to be a follower, you know, how to do all of these things and play all these different parts, I think is an amazing thing I'm going to walk away with. Yeah, that's, that is, I'll tell you from my experience, it's the social aspect, like you said, is amazing. The networks that you were able to um, foster, as well as really the different leadership experiences you're able to incur from uh, different organizations that you could be part of in on campus. So um, as a busy student, right, you're a full-time student and you're also working. How, is, how does service look like right now? Um, are you still serving? What are the organizations that you're involved in? And how does that look like? Um, service before Corona became a um, global pandemic. Yeah. It was very busy, especially around summertime. Um, I remember there was one summer where Kasi Seifa and I, Kasi Seifa Sundasi and I, um, mm -hmm. there were two weekends. We were home the whole three months of summer. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's just, it's so amazing to be able to go to all of these places and mm -hmm. even the culture within it, right? Like the fact that when we, when I go to another state, for example, for Gubai, I mm -hmm. stay with a family and I don't go to a hotel or something like that, right? How amazing is it and how blessing is it? Blessed are we that, you know, people open their homes and they're mm -hmm. like, come be a part of our family, you know? And they're like, look at our children and this is who we are and thank you for coming, you know? And they like, let you be a part of their lives. And, you know, I've had, I have a million family members, I think, 
outside of my immediate family now because of that. In every state and every place, you know, there's people that I can go to for anything. You know, they're a part of my family. So um, I'm very thankful for service. And it is very busy because of that, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But I also think because of Corona, it's almost picking up more because, you know, before it's OK, well, if I'm blocked off for a weekend, I can't go anywhere else. Yeah. But now it's OK, well, you can go to six states, you know, over Zoom <laughs> in one day, you know. <laughs> So it's getting a lot busier, um, but it's still amazing and it's very fulfilling still. Yeah. Um, so along that, the different works that you do, right, and you still continue to do, and you're also, um, you invited our Chinese leader for today as well for us. Uh, how did you get involved with uh, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church deaf community? Yes, um, the hearing impaired community, you said? Hearing impaired, yeah. Yes. So um, a couple years ago, around five years ago, um, mm -hmm. I was at a Nasugubai and um, I, I was introduced to amazing um, individuals that were a part of the EOTC Deaf Spiritual Association, um, the North American EOTC Deaf um, Spiritual Association. And they're a huge Mahabed that exists within the United States. And um, they are amazing servers within the church. Um, uh, they also they're um, they serve within Tamero um, Mastamar um, in um, Ethiopia, so Diskiro as well. Uh, there's a huge community there, and it's amazing how um, that community there, you know, came here and is still really strong and serving um, with all of the challenges that they've had. So I had the amazing opportunity to learn sign language and you know learn how to be an interpreter, and I still think I'm on my journey to being uh, an interpreter for. Um, this community, but um, it's amazing with all the obstacles they've had. A lot of times, you know, we don't give them a space within the church. We don't um, make sure there's an interpreter for them within every church. We don't ask, is there someone that is hearing impaired? You know, um, like when we have our gubais, you know, we don't have things written up. There's, we just don't put people that are hearing impaired within our mindsets when we're, you know, um, trying to make our program. So I think, um, I feel very fortunate to have known them and to know them and to be a part of their community. And I want to encourage individuals out there that are not hearing impaired, right? And that can hear um, to really open your eyes and understand that there's more, um, there's more to our church than just hearing, right? There's the, we have individuals that are blind. We have our hearing impaired brothers and sisters. We have other, you know, disabilities or um, mobility differences we have other other things you know that describe us but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't get the same amount of service or we shouldn't get that attention because God died for all of us he didn't die just for people that are hearing but the way that we carry ourselves we are discriminating actually because when you don't make a service that includes all people you are discriminating right so we need to make sure we don't discriminate because we are if we discriminate from our brother and sister that is a huge sin right that is an absolute big sin. So if we see an organization discriminating, if we see that our church is not giving them a place, it is all of our responsibility to point that out, right? We can learn a couple words in sign language, you know? Um, mm -hmm. We can learn salam, that's a huge thing, right? Mm -hmm. Learning how to say hello, it means you acknowledge that person. So yes. I really challenge you people out there that are hearing because I can't be a voice for the hearing impaired, and other um, communities because they have their own voice, right? I'm not trying to speak for them, but mm -hmm. I'm spe speaking to the people that are hearing because I'm a part of the hearing community and saying that we have to make it our responsibility to include all children of Christ, not just the ones that look like us. Yeah, I love that. That's a beautiful message. Um, so do you know how to speak the Ethiopian sign language? Speak, is that the right word to use? Yes. Okay. Um, um, I do you know. I do know, but I will, I want to be better, you know? Mm. Um, and I think there's a, the flyer that you just put on, I want to talk about a little bit about it. I know mm. we're running out of time, but um, there's a fall session that's just opened up. And if everybody can use the link or anybody that's interested, you can use the link on the bottom and maybe mm. we can post that on the Facebook too. And um, go and, you know, be a part of this fall session. It doesn't discriminate against age. Any age can be a part of this. And they're just starting their first lesson on um, Saturday. It's over Saturday and Sunday for one hour central time, um, seven to 8 p.m. and DC time, I know it's nine, uh, eight to 9 p.m. 
Um, but it's it's a great opportunity to strengthen their community, but it's also a great opportunity for us to be, you know, aware. And, you know, someone in one household, if one person in every household knew sign language, imagine what kind of a world this would be. So that should be a goal of ours, if not everybody knowing at least one person from every household. Yeah, I love that. I'll take that challenge. Um, and I'll definitely work on attending that um, that um, event that you just shared with us. I'm really excited about that. Um, we'll be right back after a quick break. Uh, uh, thank you for our viewers for continuing to join us in this conversation. And also uh, remember to share and like this conversation as well. And we'll be right back after a quick break. Adababai Media. Lo gantanya net jirbao ni sette. Iziawit kaman ambi nyebelo. የዘመመን ሊያቀና ኡነትነው ከተና አስከትሉ ኢኮኖሚያዊና መንፈሳዊ መረጃዎች እንካቹ ይላል ትኩዚኖች ዘጋቢ ፊልሞች ጥልቅ ትንታኔዎች በአደባባይ ሚዲያ ይቀርባሉ። ራያቺ ጊዜውን ያማከለና ዘመናዊ ዋጪ በእውነት የነጠሩ መረጃዎች በእውቀት ደግፎ ለሀገራችን ብሎ ለዓለም ህዝብ ማዳረስ ነው። አደሳች አደባባይ ኢንፎ ሚዲያ አት ጂሜል ዶት ኮም website at www.adababai.com yagnyun yirdun yolachin slona chitupia badababai nzikbalen adababai media Welcome back everyone. Uh we're continuing our conversation with Xara Yilma and um I would like to invite her to uh do one mesmer for us. Um yes. Sure. Thank you. Um yet if you want to come on um if you want to sing the song with me we can all sing it together and Israel she can sing along with us as well. Um we're going to sing Maryam ta'abbin kullu fitrat and we're also going to sing it in english virgin mary is greater than all of creation okay awesome so um and i'm hark esl if israel if you want to teach us the words that would be great actually and then we could sing it all along try okay so mariam mariam and everybody at home if you want to try this we can all sing together right okay mariam Maria to abbe or to bet alet or is greater to abbe in kulu in kulu fitrate fitrate Maria to abbe in kulu fitrate and then selayazet so the amharic is selayazet right so we'll sign that one selayazet isata melakute so we're kind of mixing three languages, but we're singing it in um, where the sign is in ESL because our our largest community is in ESL or is ESL speaking as well. So we chose to sing it this way, but we will sing it in all three languages so um, everyone can have a chance. Okay, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Mariam tapi imkulu fitrate. Mariam tabi in kulu fitrate Eya ya isata melakote Eya wa ya isata melakote Eha ya wa ya isata melakote Eya wa ya Isata melakote Mariam tibet anet kahulum fitrate Mariam tibet anet kahulum fitrate Sile azet isata melakote Sile azet isata melakote Eh sile azet isata melakote sile azet isata melakote virgin mary's greater from all of creation virgin mary's greater 
from all of creation because she held the divine love fire because she held our divine creator uh -huh. because she held the divine love fire because she held our divine creator in the name of the father the holy spirit one god amen Amen. Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. I should have corrected that. I'm sorry. Amen. Uh, thank you for sharing that with us. And um, I'll definitely work on learning a mesmers as well in, in sign language. Um, so thank you for that. Um, so I wonder, because now you're a full-time student, you work, you are involved with various organizations, you're in service as well. How do you manage your time? many calendars that's the shortest <laughs> answer i can give and um i have a huge problem with or committing to things that's something that if anybody knows me they'll know that that's something i have um mm -hmm. just because we're being honest um mm -hmm. but that's something that i've been able to work on because i've been able to say no to a lot of things and that's a huge skill that you know if you don't have it please get it it's the ability to say i can't commit to that you know i can't i'm sorry you know someone someone great once told me if you can't do it, someone great meeting my mother. <laughs> um, they said, uh, if, if you can't do it, say no, you can't do it. But if you have the time, do it, and then you'll surprise them, right? Mm, yeah. So um, I think that's a great lesson to be told. Yeah, I love that. So that you're not disappointing anyone and you are living within your um, limits as far as because our time is limited. Um, so you're a very visible person, especially in our church. Uh, kids look up to you a lot. My Sunday school kids love you. I'm sure that's true for a lot of Sunday school teacher, um, teachers as well. Um, how do you, and by that, you know, you're by default become a mentor, right? When you're visible and you're young and the work that you do is really amazing. So how do you prepare for that? How do you make sure that when uh, kids are looking up to you, um, you're conveying a positive message? Um, I think that's, it's about your own image. And I think it's about the way that you lead your life. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's something that's been very hard for me, especially because, you know, you have to think about every single thing you do and all of the choices you make, the things you say, uh, um, people are watching and that's something that's very, uh, it's hard. Right. Um, but I also think mentorship for the person that is going to be a mentor is a very big thing. Um, you know, all mentors also have mentors. So for me, it's um, my family, that's number one, um, my mom and my dad. And, you know, I wanna take a moment to talk about my mom as my mentor because um, Hirut Gazang is an amazing person and anyone who knows her knows that. And a lot of people, they're like, wow, you know, like they talk about Zamari Yilma, but they don't know that, you know, Hirut is behind doing all the work too, you know? Um, but she's an amazing mentor. And I think if you find that person, that uh, for me, it's my mother. And then alongside with my mother, it's also my spiritual father. Um, as youth, it's so important that we have a spiritual father as soon as possible, right? So that first introduction of spiritual father, it's our parent's spiritual father that later becomes ours. And then later if we find another father, good. And if not, we can have that father, right? So yeah. my spiritual father is not just someone that, you know, I use as repentance, because I think that's a Catholic model and a Western model. It's mm -hmm. not, um, oh, father, I have sinned. But if that father is with you through all of your decisions, then you might not even get to, oh, father, I have sinned, because you had God with you um, and you had that guidance, that spiritual guidance with you when you made all those decisions right so um your spiritual father should be a mentor she shouldn't be someone that is only there to call upon when you feel your lowest you know mm -hmm. even when you feel your highest you should be able to reach out and say you know i got accepted into this program you know or like um i need some advice on this what do you think that that connection is something that we can work on with having with our spiritual fathers yeah uh, so along that line what has been difficult for you in in service um, one of the things that has been difficult for me was, uh, that thing about being in the limelight, right? Um, mm -hmm. about being seen and, um, about people's expectations, you know, um, a lot of times, uh, when people are 
um, servers, and especially if they're serving in a spiritual sense, mm -hmm. um, it's a lot harder. Not, I wouldn't say harder, but there's other challenges that are different. So, you know, in the secular world, if someone was a writer and something happened or, you know, someone just didn't like them, they would go and say, oh, so-and-so is a bad writer, right? But in the spiritual world, you know, if, for example, someone is, you know, saying bad things about a sabaki or about a zammari or somebody, they usually attack their spirituality, which is a lot harder than just attacking the work that they put forward, right? So mm -hmm. it's, oh, the person is not Christian. Oh, metful Christian. Oh, so Christian quiet at them, you know? Oh, sumbulo, Christian Like all of these comments, you know? And it, mm -hmm. it, we hear those comments, you know, like, um, and they, they are so discouraging, I think, especially for people that are new to service, right? especially yeah. for people that are learning while they're doing the thing, you know, and mm -hmm. it's not up to us. It's if God called someone to be a deacon, you know, and they're learning while they're being a deacon. If we have a concern about that person's well-being, it's one thing to pull that person aside and say, hey, I want to mentor you on this thing or, you know, give critical and good feedback. But it's another thing to be destructive to that person because you're really pushing them away from the path of God. Uh, what outcome will happen after that? They will leave the house of God. There's no other outcome. They won't benefit themselves because you didn't say, you know, I think if you did this step differently, it would be good. You said, you are not a Christian. That's what you told them, right? Mm -hmm. So that's something that's been a huge challenge for me is, you know, people questioning my Christianity or people questioning, you know, like if I'm, you know, like if I've ever opened a Bible, if something happens. Right. But I think that's a challenge that is to be accepted when you are serving God. And that is a challenge that, you know, people that are in service welcome. Right. Mm -hmm. Because it means that you are on the right path. It means that, you know, like there are those obstacles and you know like the devil is really working hard to try to deter you from that path but i also think you know as people out there including other service to each uh, servers to each other as well right that um we can be good let's be benevolent let's help each other grow this world can have a million servers everyone should serve that's my opinion maybe i'm radical in that belief but i think every every person is a server and should find a way to you know really pull other people into service as well right because there's not enough glory that pe that can be given to God, right? There's not mm -hmm. enough glory. So that means if 7 billion people are serving God, it's still not enough for him. So mm -hmm. that means that everyone needs to be doing their part just so we can do a little part to glorify our Lord, right? Yeah. So um, I think that's another huge thing that I've been struggling with, especially looking at how youth are treated when they come to church, you know? Mm -hmm. um, if someone doesn't come to church for 10, 15 years, that one day they come to church, you know? they've forgotten about the traditions of the church or they've just, they've been so disconnected. It's, it was courageous enough of them just to walk through the doors of that church mm -hmm. that automatically someone is like, where's your net ala? Like these comments, why, why are we saying that? You know, why can't we say, brother, I haven't seen you at church. Maybe we can get together and talk about the gospel. Why isn't that mm -hmm. our first go to, you know? So we have to be better, especially if it's youth that we're trying to pull into the church. And, mm -hmm. you know, with English mesmos and English sermons, it's not just youth. It's people from outside, right? It's people outside of the Ethiopian culture and our Eritrean culture. It's people outside of the sister churches that we're trying to pull in. So they don't even know these traditions, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, it's so many types of people from different walks of life that we're putting in. And we have to be encouraging and encourage them to be in the house of God and to serve God instead of putting them off and the moment they walk in we are that obstacle you know we have to think wow like am i being like that obstacle to their spirituality and if you are then you have to stop it it's not something that you should keep doing yeah i think along that line sometimes we do forget that a spirituality is not something like i have it now and i'm done it's a journey and everybody is in their own journey and sometimes we stumble sometimes we're you know we could run and sometimes we're falling so um being able really as especially as servants of the church to give each other that space to grow and support and you know pick up when we fall and knowing that like you said um there's an enough glory we can give to God and for all of us to be servants and creating that bridge between, you know, each other and being able to have different conversations that are really hard for us is really powerful. Um, if I could take you back, though, uh, you mentioned your spiritual father being one of your mentors, one of your guides. When did you decide you needed one for yourself as opposed to the one um, seeing him with your parents? Yeah, um, so I ended up 
my spiritual father is the same as my parents, um, mm -hmm. but they did an amazing thing. Our spiritual father was always a part of our lives. Mm -hmm. um, they were always coming to the house. You know, we would invite them for dinner. Um, you know, my brothers and I would like compete cooking for them and things like that when we were younger. Like it was so fun to have them because they were a true part of our family. You know, mm -hmm. when it's a spiritual father, they are a part of your family, right? So when you have these things, when you have celebrations, when you have graduations and weddings and, you know, like things like that, they have to be a part of those conversations. So it was so easy for me to continue with that father and, you know, keep giving them parts of my life and keep making them, you know, like a big part of my life as well. And that, you know, made a great relationship between us as well. You know, there are times when, um, you know, when I went to Ethiopia, they were calling me like twice, three times a week checking up on me, you know, like, where were you? I haven't heard from you. How's everything going, you know? And it's yeah. great to have that type of a relationship and to have someone that's always picking up the phone and making sure, you know, you're okay. And no one would do that unless they're family or someone real close, right? So, um, yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. So I see that you have a lot of support in, in your spiritual world from you and, you know, your secular life from your parents and from your spiritual uh, father as well. And I was wondering for our viewers, um, what advice would you give them as far as um, raising kids or talking with the youth about the culture or religion that we have? Like, what are the things that work for you? Um, I think my advice for parents would be uh, one I think parents don't get appreciated a lot. It's always like, parents are doing this, parents are doing this, parents are doing this, right? So first I want to appreciate parents and say, you have a really hard job, right? You have blessings in the house, but your work is cut out for you, you know? It's an amazing thing to have kids, but it's a huge responsibility. And also raising our generation is not an easy thing. So I'll say this in Amharic for parents listening at home. Um, ከልብየምለው but um, um, I really appreciate that. Besides that, um, not criticizing, again, just giving a little bit of insight. I did that. Yeah. Um, I know you're already trying, parents. Again, you just you have to try a little harder. But maybe you know that American phrase: "Don't work harder, work smarter." I did that. Mm -hmm. You know, not that yelling at your kids. You know, being like, "You're not this, you're not that." Like, you know, having holding them to that strict standard. It, yeah, they deserve, or you deserve. You know. For your children and they are also um they deserve to be successful you don't wish for anything else for your children than to be you know loved by god to love god and to be successful there's nothing really outside of that you wish for their well-being mm -hmm. so if you wish for their well-being there's some things you have to do like have conversations with your children you know and i know you've probably heard that um እኔን <laughs> you know so if uh, your kid is saying you know something this happened but um it, it shouldn't be the first thing that you know you do that shouldn't be your first response so having that conversation with your kids letting them be open to talking to you you also following up you know being involved in their lives you know be friends with their friends parents you know be a part of their school lives go to their sport games go to their you know like music theater performances be a part of their lives mm -hmm. and then like they they will also include you you know so i think that's my biggest thing i want to say for parents is you have to be present in their lives you know and it's you have to also make it your job to make sure they understand their spirituality and their identity as well 
college, high school, middle school, it's a huge identity crisis, especially for this world. Because Ihi Alam, you know, it's preaching like, you know, like, so let's see. So you have to make sure that, you know, you make them a whole rounded human being, you know, again, I know it's hard, but they can help you do that as well. You know, again, those two things, their identity is identity and spirituality. It, it's the same thing, but it's also two different subjects. I don't know. So you have to make sure that those are two things you really focus on. You know, I'm not trying to repeat myself again and again. Again, it's so important and your work, it's recognized. You know, your everything you do, it's recognized. You know, and I hope that you have a good um, connection with your children in the future. And I hope you can make it work. And you need to know that it has to be like serious and direct connection. Now you cannot let that happen in your house. You have to be aggressive about it. Get aggressive with love, obviously. Yeah, I love that. So um, I love how you said, you know, we should, it's not criticism, right? It's just sharing an insight. And to that side as well, what, what do you want to say to the youth as far as understanding the parents and knowing that our parents are coming from a completely different culture, right? From a completely different, even technology wise, language wise, upbringing wise, uh, even, you know, like everything else that the day to day life that they did not grow up in and they're trying to raise kids in an environment that they're not even familiar with. So they are going to struggle. So what, what what would you say to our youth to, to be understanding of that dynamic? Um, definitely, I would say first is to understand the mindset of your parents, you know? Mm -hmm. um, there's definitely experiences I've had when I'm like, I wish, like I was like, Nati you know, and we all have that. Our parents, you know, my mom says that about her own mother, right? That's yeah. just the natural part of being a human, I think. Again, I think we shouldn't have too many of those experiences because that will bring sadness into our hearts. It shouldn't be that when our parents are sick, it shouldn't be that when they're giving up on us that we wake up, you know? So first we need to understand that at the end of the day, you know, after God, it's our family, really, right? And family, how you define it. Maybe it's not your, maybe you don't have your immediate mother, but maybe you have that maternal figure in your life, you know? Maybe you don't have an immediate father, but you have a, like a fatherly figure in your life. You have a sibling figure. Somebody mm -hmm. that, you know, you hold like family to you, you need to know that you, like those connections are important and like uh, they're necessary for life. Like you drink water, you need to have those social connections and social emotional well-being interactions, you know? Yeah. So um, for youth, I say, one, you need to be more open-minded and understanding. You need to close your ears to what this world is teaching you of parents are not understanding, parents are this, parents are abusive, parents are this. Yes, there you people have those circumstances, right? Again, yeah. um, I think you can have an, an uh, the benefit of the doubt is your your parent wants your well being. Yeah. When you are a parent yourself, you want the well being of your child, you know. So yeah. to make an effort to have those relationships with your parents is a very big thing. They are making an effort, you know. Maybe mm -hmm. they don't know. Maybe they don't know how to talk about the thing at school. Again, maybe we can meet them halfway. You know, we don't have to always expect them to come into like our area as well you know when they're downstairs and they just came from home from work and they're really tired you know you can go downstairs if they're on their phone be like mom you need to put your phone away i want to have a conversation with you tell me about your day you know yeah like we tell parents to be invested in their kids you know yeah. you we need to also be invested in our parents right you know our parents they're working for our betterment we need to work for their betterment not when they're retired you know not mm -hmm. when they're out there collecting their 501s and things like that. We need to be there for their betterment. We need to make sure, you know, how can I better this family? You know, how can I make sure like I can ease the stress of my family, you know? Because mm -hmm. it's a mutual relationship. It can't be a one-way relationship, you know? Mm -hmm. So we need to understand that just how we make an effort for a friend or a cousin or something like that, we need to make that same effort. And we need to also, you know, be um, radical in the way that we like hold our parents. We're like, no, you're not listening to me. Let's sit down and have a conversation. And maybe it's not through yelling or screaming, right? But mm -hmm. really hold your parents accountable and say, you know, you said to me that we would change these and these things. You know, if we have that conversation, mm -hmm. hold them accountable. They need to change those things that they promised you, right? Mm -hmm. It can't be always, oh, you know, like, Kelly, change this, Kelly, change this. But, you know, mom and dad, I'm going to do this, but this is what I need from you as well. It has to be that mutual conversation. And don't be afraid to do that, you know? It's not scary being open and talking about your to your family about 
all of the things at school. You know, we have taboo topics in our community people don't talk about. They don't talk about like dating, you know, they don't talk about like if we have bad friends and bad experiences with our friends, they don't talk about that, you know, they don't talk about all of these things. I remember when I was in high school, I was in theater and um, after one of our theater performances, one of the people, they invited us over and their parents were, you know, like we had a dinner celebration to celebrate the theater performance. And I remember, I think I was in ninth or 10th grade, someone there like brought out a drug while I was there. You know, their parents like left the room and like they brought out a drug, right? So what my immediate reaction was to call my mom. I immediately called her, right? What yeah. did she do? She picked me and my mom, my friend up and she's like, oh, I'm sorry you guys had that bad experience, you know? what? Like, mm -hmm. let's go have fun, right? Yeah. And like, imagine like I had that experience where I saw a drug at, you know, like a uh, get together. I called my mom and she took me out of that. You know, yeah. but we have youth that are in these spaces. They see things they're not comfortable with, but they don't have the person or that connection with their family to be like, dad, get me out of the situation. Mom, I need to leave. Big brother, get me out. You know, we don't have that connection, you know, and we need to make sure that our house is a safe space. This is where we mm -hmm. should feel safe. If anything happens to me, I can call my family, you know, and your parents too. If anything happens to me, I can call my daughter. I can call my son. Like they'll be there for me. Right. So we need to rethink our family and we need to rethink how we think about family. You know, mm -hmm. like the American standard of family is not what our society teaches us, especially for Ethiopian. You know, it's mm -hmm. we're we're more deeper than that. You know, in Ethiopia, mm -hmm. the person on the street is your family member. You know, like mm -hmm. if your shoe is untied, someone on the street will be like, oh, you know, not because they're nosy. You know, the yeah. world here will be like, oh, they're nosy. Mind your own business. Right. It's mm -hmm. not because they're nosy. It's because they don't want you to trip. You know, yep. so if you're like, mind your own business, I'm not going to tie my shoe. You are going to trip yourself. You know, mm -hmm. like when people look out for you, we need to recognize that, too. It's not someone that's overstepping their boundaries. You know, it's someone looking out for our well-being. And that's just how our community is, you know, and mm -hmm. that's a beautiful thing. Yeah, I love that. Um, I think that's the best way I could say it, honestly, and I don't want to add anything to this, but you've definitely given me um, an assignment to work on as far as my relationship with my family. So I definitely will take that up as well. Thank you so much. Um, so we're close to the closing of our program. And before we do that, I was wondering what's coming up next for you? What's the most exciting project that you're working on right now? Anything you want to share with us? Right. So... An exciting thing that we're working as a family on the topic of family, <laughs> um, we are working to open um, and to really strengthen the idea of an art center. Um, it's been uh, Zamari Elma, uh, his lifelong dream of having a space that's just centered on art and all the different aspects of art, whether it be painting or poetry or mesmur or um, all of these different things, you know? Mm -hmm. And we're holding an auction on. Um, uh, next on uh, this coming Sunday till next Sunday and we um, will publicize it a little bit but I just want to talk a little bit about how what we're hoping to do you know one of the things we're hoping to do is at least fulfill his dream of having a space that's you know an art outlet not only for himself but like for people that are also passionate about art strengthening you know that artist group because not a lot of artists have that opportunity to you know you know put on an exhibition or you know change information and knowledge about art that's something that you know a lot of people are passionate about it then it just stays a passion but it shouldn't stay a passion you know you should go after it if that's what you want so he's very passionate about it and i've told you before you know he paints day and night as well so um we wanted to really focus that and make sure that it's something that he can really um you know be happy about too and but also have a community that can benefit off of that. So um, we're auctioning off three of his paintings and their original paintings. Um, mm -hmm. And we're auctioning them off for a week. And then with those funds, we hope to strengthen this dream of this art center. Um, so I, I just wanted to talk about that. And I'm really excited for the future because I think there's a huge opportunity with growth. And especially, you know, when like we do things as a family and as a community, right? Because yeah. our family is also our community. I think it's... Um, it, it, we can we can all grow in amazing amazing places can we all need to help each other up you know not one person can succeed and then leave the rest on its own you know we have to all help each other up so yeah. i love that so when is the next album coming out how am i um, to ask that <laughs> <laughs> this album just came out so um the next one god's willing yeah. soon after we say 
Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I really hope that people get a chance to, you know, um, listen to this album. We have a website called www.yilmahaili.com. Very easy to find. Mm -hmm. um, we're only streaming it and um, selling it online. And then we're going to sl slowly transition it to having it on CD. But we thought with Corona, you know, it's hard to do physical sales and things like that. So we hope people can still take a part of it, you know, um, listening to it online. And then, you know, um, it can also give us an opportunity to make more um, got hymnology and be strengthened within that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we talked a lot about your growing up, your life, your service, um, everything else that comes with your life. And mostly I'm starting to understand it has a lot to do with our church and our faith. Um, so if you could put it in few words, what does Ethiopian Orthodox Church mean to you? Um, Ethiopian Orthodox Church for me, it means, sal it's, means salvation. That's the first thing it means to me, right? Um, it means, uh, other than salvation, I mean, it means beauty, but I think there's a lot of different things that define that beauty. And I think there's millions of things that define it, meaning all of the individuals that define that beauty, right? It's amazing that our church is not just something that it's like someone is up there and then the people just listen and then they go home, right? There's a part that every single person, a part of the congregation plays within our society and our church. And I think it's amazing how our church is tied with our culture because the moment that you know we lose our religion, we're losing our culture. So people will never let go of that because it's literally how they live. It's a lifestyle. It's not just a book. It's not just you know um, a thing you go to on Sunday or, or a thing you go to on holidays. You know um, that's why I. It's very different from you know like the Western idea of religion and how you know religion is just something that you know like you go to because you're crying and your heart hurts and things like that. You know we go to church to celebrate. You know. We go to Ennatwezekstian, to EOTC, to celebrate. We go there to cry. We go there to beg for forgiveness. We go there to ask for forgiveness of our friends. If we have a friend that, you know, we fought with, we don't send them a Google calendar and be like, hey, I want to talk to you. We say, in the Ghanai. Let's meet at church. Like, how amazing. Literally, the little things we do, you know, when uh, our mothers and fathers were going to get married, right, or, or did get married, they go in front of church and they testify their love and they testify the good thing that God has brought in their lives in front of God, right? All of the things that we do, every single thing that we do is tied with our church. So, like I said before, our culture, our salvation, our livelihood, you know, again, it's amazing to me because all the human beings and the people that make up the church it's just what truly makes up the church for me you know I, like i said before the hearing impaired community you know the people that are blind you know the children the old elderly you know the ones that are motivated about life the ones that need more help like there's so many individuals from so many different backgrounds that are at church and together we have an identity together that's going towards God and our goal is worshiping God, you know, and making sure our well-being is good so we can worship God, right? So, um, yeah, I don't know how to answer that question because it's such a deep question, you know? Um, this is the best I can do for now. That's, that's beautiful, honestly. Um, our church is so vast that it's really difficult to put it in, in short sentences, but I get I get the gist of how important it is to you. And I share that sentiment as well. It's been an amazing place of growth, support, community, life, and it's just learning every day to um, be better and knowing that everyone around me has the same goal. And I feel like that's the only place that I found myself in where everyone around me has the same goal. And that's been very inspiring um, and also very important for my growth as well as a person, not only spiritually, but overall as a person, trying to become a more kinder and compassionate person, um, having a lot of mentors um, in that aspect and finding those mentors, being open and supportive has been such an amazing thing. So I, I share your sentiments about the church as well. Um, before we close out, I again want to thank um, 
Israel Dumb Dao for joining us in this conversation and translating for us. And we're definitely learning to do better as far as uh, opening up our spaces for multiple kinds of people, like Zahra said. So thank you for being here and participating in this conversation uh, with us as well. And Zahra, before we close, if you have any last um, last thoughts you want to share with us, and also if you could tell us again where we could find um, your work as well. Sure. So um, you can find the work on uh, all social media platforms. If you have Spotify, Amazon, things like that. But if you are confused about that, go on to www.yilmahailu.com. And on that website as well, there's um, other things. You know, we're working really hard to upload um, his paintings, his gospel, mesmurs, all of those things. Um, we hope by the end of the month to have all of his um, mesmurs that he's ever worked on in his life to um, upload that on there as well. And I just wanted to talk about how, um, you know, a lot of times there's a lot of people that don't get spoken about when it comes to, because we were talking about the album, you know, Tawaharu 2 in English that came out. Um, there's a lot of people that work really hard that, you know, they're not in that limelight, but without their work, nothing could have happened, right? Mm -hmm. So definitely it's, um, you know, the people that overlook Mesmu, that's a huge thing. So for me, you know, um, my biggest person was Kasefa, and then I have obviously my father and other fathers that have overlooked these gospel songs and the words and the translations and the, like the actual, you know, the content as well. But then also, you know, um, our other brothers and sisters that are gifted in instruments, that's another huge group we over, always overlook, right? So in Ethiopia, um, we have Agel Gai Zaudu, and I want to call, I'm going to say Zamari Zaudu, and Ndal Kacho, and all of these amazing, amazing, talented people that literally work on almost all of the, you know, amazing songs we hear by the people that we love. They are working so hard on that, right? And um, I think it's important to also encourage others that, you know, service can come in all different types of things, you know? Sabakagua is service, you know, opening a health clinic at your um, local church is service, you know, doing a drive is service, um, you know, mentoring somebody is service. There's so many things that qualify as service, you know, so we need to make sure we give that platform and magnitude to people that serve in these spaces just as much as we, we're giving it to, you know, Sabakis and Zammaris as well, because they are doing maybe even more work and they're working so hard, you know, and they're behind the limelight. And even individuals here like Lamsali and that are behind the screen making sure that everything is running smoothly and everything. It's yeah. just an amazing thing. You know, I always think of service as a tree, you know, like a tree is beautiful on the outside. And there's obviously like the plants on the tree and the bark and the leaves that make it amazing, right? Yeah. But there's also the worms underneath, you know, and the soil and the water and all of these things that literally give life to that tree, right? Yeah. So, you know, Sabakis and Zamaris were out here being seen, right? But there's individuals that are giving life to these services that are not being seen, right? That needs to be thanked and their lifat and their, their um, work also needs to be understood and other people should be encouraged to be in these spaces because we need as many youth to, you know, take up these spaces as well, you know? So my last message is for youth, that first step is, you know, coming to the church is understanding the gospel. But while you're understanding gospel, I think it's important to say, okay, what do I do in my regular life? And how can I better my community? You know, how can I help my church community as well? There's so many things we can do and there's so many things we can, um, you know, do to better our global community. And we definitely have the capability of doing it. So we need to do it. Yeah, I love that. Thank you so much for being here with us today and sharing all your awesome thoughts with us. Um, we are really grateful for that. And our church is thankful for having someone so young being uh, being able to share as much wisdom as you've been able to share with us as well. And we can't wait to see what's next for you and what God has planned for you as well. Um, so thank you for being here. And um I'd like to thank everyone from Adawa family that uh, you've been watching us as well. And uh, Zari and Tawalo want us know service is very important. And let's go ahead and find places within our church, within our community, even within our own families, uh, places where we could serve, we could be of service. And in Kwanarar Sachu Malet and Feligalan, Legish and Mariam, Baalu, Betrun, Hayden, Nasawalan. Until we see you next week, um, we'll have another event next week as well. And we'll invite you 
to join us with your family, uh, your kids, with your parents um, as well, and be part of this conversation. And we'll see you back tomorrow with our regular time schedule. And until then, have a wonderful week.